What's up guys? The channel just hit 30,000 subscribers and I'm making this video to answer some of your questions and just to celebrate and reflect over the last period. Uh, I'm super thankful for all of you following my channel. I'm learning so much from you as well. Uh, just reading the feedback, reading the comments, interacting with you guys is super valuable for me as well. So I'm, I'm very grateful for, for each one of you. Having said that, over the last period, I've been focusing more, I guess you noticed, on, on these uh, ML uh, code walkthrough videos. So uh, do let me know whether you find those interesting. Uh, any comment, feedback, whatnot, what can I improve there? Uh, what do you want to see more of? Whatever pops on your mind, feel free to just kind of comment down below I'll answer every single comment and yeah I'm looking forward to to your to your thoughts so I'm making this video also to just uh, answer some of your questions so this morning I posted uh, a couple of uh, posts to LinkedIn and Twitter and I collected some of your questions so I thought just going through them and uh, answering them and hopefully uh, you get something useful out of this video okay guys so let's start with the first one um, Ahmed Tech here uh, says so congratulations this is a great channel thanks Ahmed uh, my question is, should I go for a research engineer position or a research scientist position? What is the difference in roles and who generally has more impact? Uh, this is one of the, <laughs> the questions where the answer is really it depends. It depends on the team you're in, it depends on the project you have, it depends on the phase of the project and it depends on your particular role. So there is a lot of overlap between what a research engineer and research scientists uh, do. So it, again, it varies a lot and sometimes a research engineer will be doing more research than a research scientist in particular phases of the project and vice versa. So it really depends on, 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 on the particular team you land in. Uh, and uh, the second related question from Ahmed as well, um, also, what do you think of being a research engineer for one to three years, then becoming a research scientist with a PhD? I feel this is the best thing to do. Um, so I personally encourage you to, so this is just my advice, my personal like uh, uh, thinking on this topic is only if you're passionate about a particular topic and you really want to invest all like uh, four or five plus years uh, investigating this particular research topic, then you should go and do the PhD route. Otherwise, you probably don't want to do PhD, but that's just my two cents. Um, uh, touching on the impact topic a little bit, uh, again, uh, basically the impact inside of a company is usually measured, so the proxy we use is the, the, the level you're on, so the senior, seniority. And basically I can give you REs who are of higher levels than some RSs and thus they've been more impactful. Uh, using that 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 metric, so it really really depends, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't uh, consider any each like any of these two as a superior to the other one. They are just different, and ultimately there is a lot of overlap. So that's those are my two cents. Uh, the second question comes from Kevin Crow. Um, the first one is um, so if you were doing a machine learning PhD, what would be your preferred area of research and why? So obviously I haven't been I haven't done a PhD because that's my personal um, like choice. I, I think that um, it's much better for me to to do this self education path and just uh, have a broader overview of the field rather than zooming into a particular topic. That's just my personal preference. Uh, but um, if I were to choose, I would probably be uh, well. This is kind of not not really ML, but uh, related especially nowadays. So somewhere on the intersection like scaling or, or high performance computing, so HPC, uh, that will be an interest like the compilers or just like uh, how, how to scale models to, to, to well, much bigger sizes. That's interesting. Uh, reconciling learning and causality. That's something that's very uh, interesting and currently uh, people are working on that very hard. So I think uh, I'm, I would maybe try that one. Uh, geometric ML is something I'm super passionate about. And finally, RL. So there is a lot of cool recent projects coming uh, coming from OpenAI and others uh, where like basically um, we are learning the human preferences using uh, certain RL methods. So I think RL still has a lot uh, to say uh, in the future of AI. Uh, the second question from, from Kevin is how is living in London? Um, it's super great. I, I love it. It's a, such a multicultural city. Uh, you, can, you can find um, anything really what you want to do. Um, like I live in Camden, so that area is, is, is uh, very nice. Uh, I have like Regent's Park, which is a huge park here in London, fairly nearby and uh, uh, like, yeah, I I'm loving it so far. 
Thanks for the question, Kevin. Um, the 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 next swap, the next one is uh, from Haitham. Uh, so I have one question. What are the skills and knowledge that you think are most important for AI scientists to have in this new era? Um, I'm going to go a bit meta here and not focus on any particular technology uh, or skill set. So I'm going to focus on things such as you need to have patience. Uh, <laughs> you need to be willing to learn, to constantly learn and, and self-improve. Uh, you need decent communication skills and um, a lot of I think a lot of engineers and scientists struggle with this one but this is super important uh, ultimately you're going to be collaborating with people and you want you don't want the bottleneck to be your your like a uh, lack of communication skills um, some software engineer skills are, are super recommended no matter the role to be honest uh, even if you're RE RS or what well if you're a software engineer obviously you need software engineer skills but like uh, that's maybe like a basic uh, skill, uh, a fundamental skill, uh, and uh, of course some some domain expertise. Uh, depending on on, on the role uh, you're working in, uh, there'll be different things you'll want to learn. Depending whether you're doing uh, computer vision or or RL or this or that, you'll want to learn different frameworks, different technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, okay, so the next one is from Marco. Um, have you thought about doing interviews on your channel? Um, and by interviews, I assume Marco means uh, uh, podcast here. Uh, I'm planning to do those maybe some sometime in the future, or I, I might occasionally surprise you with some interesting guests on this channel. But so far, uh, I don't have any any clear plans on that. Um, I'll have to skip the the second one here because I do work at DeepMind. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, the the next one comes from Igor. Um, what uh, what about are you most excited in deep learning today? Uh, and I have to say, so again, my personal preference here is just scaling various existing approaches. And the reasoning behind this, and I, I don't want to sound like that like AGI is coming guy, but uh, uh, the, the, the my reasoning here is we haven't even scaled to the scale of a human brain. So human brain has roughly, let's say, 80 billion neurons, and on average, there is maybe 10,000 connections. So all in all, there is like, what, one quadrillion like synapses in the brain, and we are nowhere close to that, to that scale. And uh, since we are still not seeing any situation, why would we stop? Plus, the brain size is a fictional limit. Why not go 10x the brain size or 100x the brain size? As, as long as we don't see the, the situation, I think it's a, it's a viable path forward. Not the only one, but like a, a one that looks at to be very promising. And so I think we, we need to, to kind of build up those muscles. So I like to think about that uh, similarly to how gaming uh, like inadvertently uh, was the cause for us to build the GPU muscles and then we could use the GPU muscles to, to do deep learning. And similarly here, if we just uh, develop the skill of building huge models, maybe later on when, when some novel research idea uh, comes, um, like pops into the, um, well, into the consciousness of the, of the research community, then we can easily scale it up. And ultimately we know that uh, all of the biological intelligence that exists on this world does have a bunch of neurons and bunch of bunch of connections so we knew we know that scale is a necessary factor probably not sufficient but but yeah uh there was a bit longer answer there the next one what do you do after work in london before you go to make ai videos how do you relax so for me it's usually uh doing power naps uh working out i i, I started running a lot here in london uh, I also watch podcasts with my girlfriend uh, and uh, every now and then I, I try and travel around. So I, I recently, like uh, literally a week ago, came back from, from my Italy trip. So that was ver fairly refreshing, just kind of charging the batteries. Okay, let's go for the next one. Uh, in a lot of papers, there is a replicability issue as the models get bigger and bigger and significantly more powerful hardware is required. If you were to organized conferences, would you try to do something regarding that? Do you believe that good papers that required insane amount of computational power would have still been possible if they weren't to have access to the required hardware? For example, DALI 2 or GPT-3. So there's multiple questions bundled into this one. I'm gonna try and dissect it maybe starting from the, from the last one. So it's obvious that uh, these models would not ha have been possible. Uh, without the scale, because we do know that the certain like skills emerge with the scale, and has all of the all of this scale is all you need uh, hype going on. Um, I think that uh, so, like uh, 
big science uh, like effort is a, is a good example of what like an open source what what a community could do uh, when, when we come together and and build something together so if you're not familiar with this there was this huge language model 176 billion parameters called bloom that came from big science and uh, that, that's an example of how people coming together can build awesome stuff Eleuther AI is also a good example where we're just passionate individuals applying for, I think it was the TPU research crowd or something, you can apply for that and get some free TPUs. And then literally they made, they, they, they built a model that had 20 billion parameters, the GPT Neo X 20B. So uh, I do think this is a problem, especially when we, when we realize that skills do emerge with scale. Uh, so here are some, I gave you some examples like Eleuther AI and big science effort. Uh, as examples of, of what we can do. But there is also a lot of things we can do, a lot of research directions that don't need that type of a scale. But like, I don't wanna be that guy saying, so I don't wanna be that guy uh, downplaying the importance of, of, of having like a, a access to, to a nice amount of resources. So yeah, these are just some ideas of how uh, you can maybe join those um, organizations or, or yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, the, the one from Stefan here, uh, when will AI finally become conscious? Asking for a friend's grandmother who is very concerned. So I, I tell the grandma not to be uh, like worried. Uh, it won't be conscious anytime soon, but slightly conscious, who knows? Uh, okay, so <laughs> Brian Palfer uh, here uh, says, Congratulations, Alexa. I'd love to know more about your experience in a top AI company like DeepMind and how it has affected your view about ML, if at all. Uh, I'd also be curious to know your opinion about the next big thing in the field. As a DeepMind employee, you probably have a sense for the field that others don't. Congrats again and keep up the amazing work you're doing. Thanks, Brian. So, so my experience so far with DeepMind is that the company really cares about the employees. The, the, the environment is amazing. The people are, are amazing. I mean, you do have a bunch of world-class experts around you and just learning by osmosis and reaching out to those, to those folks is super valuable. You can, you can, they're usually super responsible. Like I, I literally had a conversation with Ian Goodfellow a couple, actually yesterday. So, so yeah, I, I really love it so far. Okay, on to the second part of your question. Um, Basically, how had, has it affected my view on the ML field? Uh, I think just being present uh, on the on the edge of what's going on in the in the research in in our community, um, I realized like how how, how crazy we, we have this commonality of engineers experience. Uh, when, when when I say that, I mean suffering. Uh, if you take a look at some of the of the recent uh, chronicles, that for example, let me show you. Let me open up a, a page here. On GitHub, so here is the um, like uh, chronicles from the uh, like Meta's uh, training of this huge uh, LLM that this was like 175 billion parameter big. You can see like problems that they are facing, like like cluster deletion. L let me read this for you. So, given the holidays, we requested a pool of 12 buffer nodes to guard against hardware failures. Two machines go down every day. In the process of replenishing this pool, the cloud provider's support team accidentally deleted our entire cluster on December 21st. So things like this happen all too often, even in companies such as Meta and, and, and others. Let me show you another example from, from the big science uh, effort I mentioned, the blue model. So these guys literally had some problems with the stability. You can see the, the spikes in the loss. So the, the, the loss would go up and never return back to its uh, initial value, neither go down obviously, so the, the training would diverge. And one of the things they, they, they noticed analyzing the spikes is that they literally have, so they said here, two million backslash only samples in our data set. So literally like a string of two million backslashes uh, that that somehow nobody noticed uh, up until this point when the when the when the training started diverging and so problems like this pop up all, all the time even if you work on 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 in the best companies in the world uh, wherever you are uh, all people like all engineers and scientists are struggling and having to deal with various different issues and I think. Um, having that getting that perspective not just internally in deep mind but this is uh, I showed you here some external examples you can see how how uh, the everyday work of an engineer or a scientist looks completely different compared to what people usually think uh, as for the next big thing I can only give my personal opinion here obviously uh, I'm not representing deep mind here on this channel uh, I, I, I as I said I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in in, in scaling um, 
the current existing approaches. I'm not saying those are sufficient, I'm just saying those are necessary. And uh, like building those muscles is something that's gonna be uh, super useful uh, over the long run. Um, that's it guys, those are the questions I kind of selected. Um, thanks a lot for asking those questions. Uh, again, leave the feedback down below. If you have any ideas, any suggestions, what I, I should add to my channel or improve or change or whatnot, feel free to just comment down below. Uh, and yeah, having said that, subscribe to this channel. Uh, if you haven't, let's go to 50K, let's go to 100K uh, and, and beyond. So until next time, bye bye.